um, I've been in Cape Breton, as Pam said, for just shy of three years now. And in that space of time, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the visual arts on Cape Breton Island. Um, what are the contours of the visual arts here? How are they understood and how are they received? Um, so this casual investigation has kind of led me to address the question that I'm here to speak with you tonight about, and also talk about a project we're doing at the gallery. Um, and that question is, what does contemporary art have to do with Cape Breton? So, an important part of my very quick discussion tonight is uh, defining contemporary art because um, it's not just art that's contemporaneous. It's not just things that are being made now. It's a way of thinking about art that's been around basically since the Second World War, but that's really come into its own in the last sort of 20 years, 30 years. Um, so I've come up with a very rich with information table for you guys tonight. Um, just to talk quickly about the old paradigm of thinking about art or the traditional understandings of the visual arts and the new paradigm, uh, which basically is a description of contemporary art, how we, how we think about contemporary art. So the old paradigm um, is largely what I think the general public is entrenched in when we think about the visual arts. It's based in the object. It's uh, thinking about and exploring the possibilities of the materials or the medium. Um, the object reigns supreme, uh, and therefore it's really well suited for traditional settings like art galleries or the room we find ourselves in tonight. Um, it's also generally commodified or consumerist, so it's something that can be bought or sold. Um, I like to call it art in the service of. So that's when art works or can work in the service of something else, and that largely describes the visual arts for most of the history of uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, art can work in the service of religion or a political regime, and there are you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of examples of that. More recently, and right here on Cape Breton Island, we see art working in the service of tourism, which is sometimes uh, part of a predetermined cultural agenda. Um, and we see many, many examples you know, around the world of mar uh, marketing and capitalism, uh, where arts are working in the service of those things. Um, in the new paradigm, things have changed somewhat. Um, we're still talking about an exploration of materials, but those materials tend to be things that are uh, grounded in modes of expression. So uh, those things could be per performance or installation, new media or social practice, and that just names a few uh, newer modes of expression. Um, these modes privilege the idea over the object. As such, they're not really intended for traditional settings. So not something you can really hang on a wall, and also not something you can buy or sell. Um, and as, you know, positioning art this way means that the artist has a lot more control over um, the end product. It's not something that can be controlled by an institution. Um, and an institution, I mean, that can be anything really broad, but it can be a gallery, it could be a commercial gallery or uh, an art dealer. Um, it could be a government. Uh, so it really puts the control of the arts back in the hands of the artist um, and presents an alternative for artists who want to work outside of institutions. So I'm kind of you know, speaking out of both sides of my mouth here because I'm here as the representative of an institution, but at the same time, I'm really an advocate for this new way of thinking about art. Um, and maybe some of us can imagine, if you attended Lumiere last year, you can imagine how that falls into this second category. Um, really important to note here that uh, these, the old paradigm is still alive and well. Uh, it hasn't gone anywhere. There are certainly many artists still making art objects. Uh, thank heavens. I mean, that's one of the reasons those of us who are interested in the arts are. Um, and so I'd like to suggest that the, the vertical um, line here isn't a divisive line. It's actually uh, something that's porous. So artists uh, working in contemporary modes also adopt uh, forms that are from that old paradigm and, and vice versa. So there's a lot of exchange happening between the old and the new. So there you go. That's, that's my talk. No, uh, <laughs> obviously, why? Why does this matter? Why should we care? What does this have to do with Cape Breton? Um, it, that's kind of what my project is about that I'll speak about momentarily. But in the new paradigm, the role of the artist changes considerably. Um, they're not so much part of an institution. They're not living in a box anymore, uh, separated from society. They're much more socially and critically engaged. The role of the artist as a social um, commentator is something that uh, becomes more and more prevalent in the new model. Um, and that allows us to sort of look critically at ourselves as a group or as individuals, and also more excitingly, think about new ways that we can imagine living in the world. Um, 
So hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going with this and what this has to do with living in and, and working as artists in our community. Um, the role of the artist can become quite central to any society, particularly in times of transition or upheaval or change. Um, so in mulling this all over, I've come to the conclusion that there's a real gap here on the island in terms of the infrastructure and support that contemporary art practitioners have access to. Um, and this in turn you know, can result in the out-migration of a lot of young artists who want to work in a contemporary mode. Um, so what do we do about this? How do we address this gap? Um, and that's really what my project is largely about. Um, last year, around this same time, I issued a call for submissions across the country looking for artists that identified themselves as uh, Cape Breton artists who were under the age of 35 or 40. So young, emerging, or mid-career mid uh, artists who identified themselves as Cape Breton artists. So they're either, either from here and working somewhere else, or they're from somewhere else and they're now working as artists on the island. And then what I asked them to do was to propose projects for an exhibition that really addressed their perception of the creative climate on this island. So what are the obstacles about working as, as an artist here and what are the opportunities about working as an artist here? Um, while some artists obviously thrive here, others have to leave to determine their creative paths off the island. So I wanted to know what are the factors that contribute to this? What are the ideologies um, that artists find themselves working within here? Um, and the resulting exhibition is something that I think paints a really interesting portrait of the island and probably one that we're not quite as familiar with as, for example, the things we see around us tonight. So there are eight artists who are involved in the show, which will be taking place from the end of August to the beginning of November, so basically the fall months of this year. And the artists who are involved uh, come from as far away as the UK. Uh, there's one from Vancouver, one living in Saskatoon now, one in Toronto, two in Halifax, and uh, to her living and working here in Sydney now. Um, so in addition to the exhibition itself, what I'm really hoping to do, and I'm hoping all of you get involved, is to offer a lot of programming around the exhibition to animate it, um, and to continue having these kinds of discussions so I don't have to talk so fast. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'd like to get, for you folks, you're more than welcome. I would love to have you come out. We're gonna have a discussion panel with the artists who are involved in the show to talk to them about what their needs are, what they really see. So they're gonna represent this visually in the show, but what are they, let's talk about it in, in, in spoken language <laughs> that we're maybe a little, little more comfortable with. What are those artists missing or what do they see here that really works for them? So there's gonna be an opportunity for that and I'll also invite some young artists working in other areas. Uh, to come out and, and present about their uh, practice. And let's talk about things like, what, are, what is relational aesthetics? And what's performance art all about? So maybe just to introduce the general public in a really accessible way to these forms of art that might not feel that comfortable to us. Um, so I'm gonna show you really quickly a few examples um, of, of works that are uh, by artists who are going to be involved in this show. This piece is by Gwen Aker, who's now living in the UK. Um, a lot of Gwen's work are sculptural installations dealing with the conditions that women live in, particularly where they're socially oppressed or victims of violence. Um, and Gwen links this to concepts of freedom of voice and expression uh, for female artists living in this community. Um, these are textile works by Carrie McClellan, who's now living in Toronto. Um, Carrie's work in this series, called Granite Planet, uh, examines her concept of home, particularly what happens when that concept becomes fractured. Um, in this case, she's represented uh, her home that she grew up in from 1986 to 2005, uh, which is in Inverness County. And then she's got these iconographic symbols of cranes that actually stand for her father when he was working around the country. Um, so, uh, you know, she's found interesting ways of representing her relationship to the island um, graphically and through textile. Um, these are images by an artist named Donald Roach, who's now living in Saskatoon. Um, he's a painter, and uh, I would describe his style as sort of a new social realism. So, as you can see here, these are not your standard depictions of Cape Breton Island. They're not romanticized you know, snapshots of Cape Smokey. Um, and he does not romanticize the, the new Waterford where he grew up of his youth. Um, in fact, he really resists the urge to engage in the tourist gaze um, in, through painting. Um, and Roche describes the figures that populate his works as embodying the profound social and demographic shifts of many small post-industrial Canadian communities. So he's situating his own practice, not only within um, the contemporary painting movement, um, but within the national context for social change. 
Um, and this is an example of a work by Sarah Roth, who's in the room. Ooh, go, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's um, screen printed wallpaper. And um, what's really exciting about this, I think, is that Sarah's use of repetition obviously uh, presents us with a, de a really decorative design, but that design disguises the figures that are in there. So I don't know if you can see um, there are figures of animals and, and more cranes um, in this work. So this kind of creates a tension between what she's made. So this is decorative wallpaper, but then the stories that that wallpaper can also tell us. And there's, I think Sarah's uh, wallpapers that I have seen can be both gritty and kind of whimsical. So. Um, Sarah is from BC originally and has moved here and is working successfully as an artist. And I think she's a great example of um, a different kind of perspective. And maybe in, in Sarah's case, we could characterize that as um, something that's an amalgam of, of mythology and also just sort of an outsider's observation. So I'm done. <laughs> um, thank you for bearing with me. I'm sorry I spoke so quickly. I hope that you'll all join me this fall for The Glass Is, which will be opening on August 24th. I'd love to see you all there and for continued discussions on this topic. Thank you. Thank you.